Uh, so thank you everyone. Like Liam said, my name is Kristen Lear. I'm currently finishing my PhD at the University of Georgia. And I've been working in bat conservation for over 11 years officially now, working in places like Texas, Australia. Um, now I work in Mexico with the conservation of endangered pollinating bats. But I actually got my, my start in, um, in sixth grade when I built bat houses for my Girl Scout Silver Award project. So I have, this has been a lifelong passion for me and I'm super excited to share some of the world of bats with you all and what we can all do to help bats. So um, bats around the world are super diverse. There's over 1400 species currently known all over the world. And these pictures here are just some of the amazing animals, the amazing bat species that there are. And we can see the huge diversity of bats. We have little tiny white bats in the top left, the Honduran white bats that are tent making bats. Um, they kind of look like little marshmallows. They're really small and they eat insects. Uh, we have some of the, one of the carnivorous bats in the middle here um, that eats things like frogs, uh, other, other animals, other, other bats even. We have the nectar feeders that I'm currently working with that pollinate lots of different plants around the world and everything in between. So there's a huge diversity of bats around the world. And they make up about 20% of all mammal species. So about one in every five mammals is a bat. And bats are found all over the world except Antarctica. So they're on every continent um, except Antarctica. They're, they're even in places like Alaska that has five species places like Siberia, uh, places that you necessarily wouldn't think would have bats, but, but do. And here in the US, we're actually home to Bracken Cave in San Antonio, which is the largest colony of any mammal in the entire world. And we can see here, this is part of the emergence when they come out in the evening. And there's the swirling of bats, and it's fantastic. And there's between 15 to 20 million of these Mexican free-tailed bats in this one cave. So here in the US, we call this, this our kind of pride and joy for the bat world, Bracken Cave. If you ever get a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. So what about some of the bat myths? Uh, some of the bat myths we have are things that we hear pretty commonly, right? One of them is that bats are blind, right? You hear the saying, blind as a bat. Well, that is not true. That is one of the, the myths. So all bats have eyes and all bats can see. We can see these two different bats here um, have eyes, but they're different sizes. And that's because some bats, the micro bats, like the one on the top here, also use echolocation in addition to vision. So they're using the sonar to help them navigate at night, which is why their eyes aren't necessarily as big. The one on the bottom is one of the mega bats that eats fruit. And because the fruit is not flying around, they're not chasing insect prey, they don't really have to have this echolocation to help them navigate. So they have instead big eyes and a big nose to help them find their fruit prey. But like I said, all bats do have eyes and all bats can see. Another one of those myths is that bats are rats with wings or flying rodents, right? We probably hear this a lot. I, I do get this a lot. Um, and while bats are mammals, just like rodents, they are not rodents. They belong to their own order of animals ca called Chiroptera, which in Latin means hand wing. So if we look at this image of a bat wing and a human arm and hand, we can see that the bat arm has the same arm bones as a person. And the cool part is that the bat wing that has the same hand bone fingers as we do. So here up on top is the thumb, then they have the pointer finger here, then they have this really long one is their middle finger, then they have this one which is their ring finger, and then this really long one is their pinky. So they actually fly with their hands which is why it's called chiroptera, hand wing. So again bats are not rodents, they're their own order of animals. Another one of those myths is the, the vampire bat or the vampire myth, right? That all bats suck blood and eat blood. And there are three vampire bat species in the world that are all in Latin America. And these vampire bat species do eat blood. Um, they usually eat blood from things like cattle or wild birds, um, but they don't actually suck blood. They don't latch on and suck. 
they, like you can see here, they make a little cut in usually the foot of the animal and then drink the blood, like lap it up like a, a cat laps up milk. So these are only three though, only three of the 1400 species that we have around the world. So what do the rest eat? The rest majority eat insects. So about 70% of bat species around the world, including all the ones we have here in Georgia, are insectivorous. So they're eating things like uh, these moths at night. Some of them eat cockroaches, which is kind of cool, you know, you know, get rid of not all the cockroaches. We do need cockroaches, but um, they keep them under control. Also things like mosquitoes. So bats are out at night, so are mosquitoes. So the bats are eating mosquitoes. And a really cool thing about some of these bats that eat insects is that they can eat up to their body weight in insects in a night because they're flying around. This takes a lot of energy. These are usually the females that are either pregnant or lactating and they require even more energy. So this is a lot of insects. So if we had to eat enough quarter pounder hamburgers to be like a bat in one night, how many would we have to eat? I won't make you actually do the math, it's the weekend after all, but we would have to eat about 600 hamburgers, which I don't know about you, but I don't think I could do that. And the bats are doing this every night during the summer and they're eating all these insects. And this is, if we think back to Bracken Cave, remember the video with the 15 to 20 million bats, this means that they're going out on the landscape and eating these pest insects, things like agricultural pests. So this video here shows San Antonio and it shows Bracken Cave. And I'll, it'll show you as they come out, we're gonna watch this part right here, especially. As it comes out, oh, there it gets darker and darker. This is weather radar and they're actually picking up the bats. All of that blooming and on all, all these other blooming areas out here are smaller caves of bats. These bats can be picked up on weather radar because there's so many of them. And what's around San Antonio, what's around this area of Texas? Agricultural fields, fields like corn and other, other crops that we rely on. So these bats are going out on these agricultural landscapes and eating tons of insects. And with these insects, it's calculated, there was a, a study done back in, I think, 2011, that bats just in the US alone save our agricultural industry about $23 billion a year in pest control services. So this is a huge amount of money savings that the farmers save because they don't have to spray as many pesticides on their crops since the bats are eating those pests. And then we save money at the grocery store because those, those costs are saved to the consumer too. So these bats are really important for pest control services. Now, what about other species? There are other species around the world that eat things like nectar, for example. We can see this one on one of the cactus species and it's going up to the flower and getting covered in pollen. And then they spread that pollen all over to different, different plants. And over 300 different types of plants around the world rely on bat pollination to reproduce. So things like bananas, Mangoes, I love mangoes and bananas. What about cashews? What about cacao to make chocolate? That's my favorite for sure. But even things like avocados and even tequila, because we use agave plants to make tequila and bats pollinate agave plants. So without bats, we wouldn't have all of these products. It would be a much sadder world, I think, without some tequila and chocolate. <laughs> and this one here, you can see this is an agave plant, an agave flower. And the bat is coming up and they grab onto the flower and they shove their head in there and they get, again, they get covered in pollen. So these bats are really important because they can get covered in pollen, but also they can fly really long distances. A lot of times bats are flying farther in the night than other animals like birds or, or insects. Some of these bats can fly 30 to 40 miles one way in a night from their cave to go forage and then come back. So they're foraging on this large area and spreading pollen all around which is great for the plants. And some of the, these, in, or these uh, nectar, nectar feeding bats oopsies, have this really cool adaptation. They have a super long tongue. So if we look here, look at that tongue, it's coming out. It's one and a half times the bat's body length. This is the, the bat species with the longest tongue. And you might think on how on earth do they fly around with that tongue hanging out? but they actually have a cavity in their chest that they use and it kind of coils up in there when they're not using it. And then it comes out to get deep inside the, the flower to reach the nectar. Also another cool adaptation for nectar feeding is 
they have papilla, which kind of like hairs, they look like hairs, on their tongue. So this is a, a zoomed in uh, image of the bat's tongue. And you can see all these little projections coming off. And what do those do? Those help grab the nectar. So we're gonna see here, it'll help grab the nectar. So there it is. So go, you can see that the hairs are erect when it goes into the nectar. And then we'll get an even close up view of how it pulls out the nectar. And there they are again, pretty crazy looking. So if we look, it's gonna come down into the, to the nectar and you can see it's actually pulling up the nectar from the surface. And that's how they get it into their mouth because they can't get their mouth all the way down to the nectar. So these really cool adaptations allow them to get into the nectar to feed, but also again, get covered in pollen while they're doing it. So there are some frugivores, fruit eating bats around the world. Um, these are the ones like in Australia that we hear, the flying foxes, they're eating fruits. And we can see they, they shove the fruit in their mouth. This one has a fig and they, they suck the juice out. That's the main part that they eat. And then they spit out the rest of the, of the uh, fruit. And what's in the rest of the fruit? Seeds, exactly, seeds. So they're carrying all these seeds. We can see these pictures here. They're carrying these seeds. And like I said, a lot of these bats are flying pretty far distances. So they can either spit out the seeds or poop out the seeds, which then can grow into new plants. So bats are really important for regenerating places like tropical rainforests that have been cleared for, for other uses. Bats are really, are really important to help regrow these areas. Um, and before we go on, I love talking about the, the carnivorous bats that I mentioned earlier. So some of the bats are eating things like frogs. That poor frog is about to get it, but pretty, pretty cool. Uh, we have a bird. So some bats do catch and eat birds during the bird's migration. And I know there's probably some bird lovers here, so I'm sorry. I love birds too. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, that's part of the food chain. I will have you know that there are birds that eat bats too, so it kind of evens out the score. <laughs> and there are bats that eat other mammals. So this one has a rodent, but there are bats that even catch smaller bats and eat them. And there's even a fishing bat. There's several species of bats that fish and eat, eat the fish. So you can see here, this one actually, they actually go fishing. They have really big back feet and they skim over the top of the water. And usually the, these fish are kind of hanging out on the top of the water and they, they grab the fish from the water and into their mouth and then fly away and then eat it. And they go perch somewhere and eat it. So we can see all these diverse uh, bats all around the world. And what are some, some fun facts? I love talking about some of the really cool facts about the bats. Um, so this is the branch myotis, which is found in places like Siberia. And it has the world's longest lifespan of any mammal in the entire world, of it, a mammal of its size. So it's about the size of like a, a big mouse. Um, and usually mice, what, live like two to three years, right? This bat has been recorded in the wild to live at least 41 years, which is crazy for how small this bat is. How on earth do they do that? Um, this was really cool because um, some researchers caught an individual bat. They banded it just like you banned a bird. You can ban bats with a, an ID tag. And then they let it go. And then 41 years later, another group of researchers caught this individual bat and read the tag and were like, oh my God, like this is 41 years old. And the, the bat was an adult when they first caught it. So it was at least 41. And this is actually really important because bats are really good at living long lives. Um, apparently some of these bats that live a long time, they actually have some sort of mechanism where their, their DNA does not degrade as quickly as for example, ours does. So they don't get cancer as much. Um, we don't see hardly any cancer rates in bats. Um, in a lot of bat species. So how do they do that? Um, they can live a long time. They, can, they often can live with things like viruses without getting sick. So people are studying their immune systems and studying their metabolism and, and their DNA to figure out, is there something that we can use from that to help our own immune systems or our own long, you know, our lives? So bats actually might be the key someday to the, the fountain of youth as the proverbial saying goes. What about the biggest and smallest bats? I get this question asked a lot. 
Um, so this is one of the flying fox species. Um, I would not recommend doing this. This is a like a tourist thing. It's not you know good for the bat, but it does show some perspective. So this is one of the world's largest bat, and it has a wingspan of about six feet. So that's longer than you know my my wingtip to wingtip, my uh, fingertip to fingertip. But how much does it weigh? You might think, who knows? Probably a lot. Two pounds. That's it. Two pounds. So. Unlike birds, the bats, most of their, their kind of volume is from their wings, and their wings are really thin, kind of like tissue papery, stretchy material. So it actually doesn't weigh that much. Um, and this makes their flight pretty efficient. They, they don't weigh too much. So we have a big bat, six foot, two pounds. And they, these bats are the fruit eaters, so they only eat things like fruit, so we don't have to worry about them at all. Now, what about the world's smallest bat? So we have the bumblebee bat, as it's commonly known found in places like Thailand. And you can see this bat is less than the size of your thumb tip, which is crazy. But then how much does it weigh? It might, again, probably pretty small, and we're right. This time it weighs less than a penny, so less than three grams. So we have everything from the bumblebee bat, the size of your thumb tip, to six foot wingspan, and everything in between. And across the world, like I said, there's currently 1,411 species. There's 47 in the US and 16 here in Georgia. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the Georgia bats and some of the things where we might see them here in Athens in particular, and then what we can do to help bats. So like I said earlier, all of Georgia's 16 species are insectivorous. Um, so they're out eating things like mosquitoes and agricultural pests. And these are some of the most common ones up top um, that we'll go through in more detail. And then the two in the bottom, the gray bat and the Indiana bat in red, these are the two endangered bat species that we have here in Georgia. These bats aren't really found anywhere, not in Athens really, they're, they're found mo more in North Georgia in the mountainous areas. So one of the coolest bats, this is one of my favorite bats in the world, is the Mexican freetail bat. And this is the one that we saw in Bracken Cave in that video with the 15 to 20 million. So we have these bats here in Athens too, and in Georgia, they're really common. And a cool fact about them is they are the fastest animal flyer in the whole animal kingdom. So I'm talking about in straight powered flight because a peregrine falcon can, can dive the fastest about 200 miles an hour or so in a dive. But these tiny little bats can fly the fastest in straight flight. They can fly up to 100 miles an hour. And we're talking about about this big. So the next time you're out on the highway, you know, driving about 65 miles an hour or so, think about how this bat is going way faster than you. And it's just this big. And they can do this because you can see their wings here are really long and they're really, they're, their wings are well adapted to fast flight. Um, other bat species have shorter wings that are more for agile, for maneuvering between trees. But these, like, these bats like to fly far distances, like we saw in that, uh, weather radar video. So the big brown bat, I like this picture, it kind of looks like he's smiling. Um, the big brown bat is one of the most common bats across a lot of the US. And they're one of the species that's really well adapted to people and to being around cities and you know, buildings. So if you have a bat in your house here in Georgia, it's, it's likely a big brown bat or one of the Mexican freetail bats, because again, both species are, are pretty well adapted to living in, in urban areas. And these are ones, if you see bats flying around street lights or a stadium, again, these are really commonly found under these street lights because they're hunting the insects that are gathering there. So these, these big brown bats are really common. Now, eastern red bats are also pretty common here in Athens and in Atlanta. Um, they are, I love these bats because they're really unique in that they are not cavity dwellers. So they don't roost inside tree hollows they don't roost inside buildings or caves. They are, they are foliage roosters, which means they're hanging from the tree leaves, like we can see in this picture here, which is kind of nuts. They're just hanging out among the branches. So you could actually see one of these theoretically when you're on a hike or you know, in a park and you look up and there's a bat. And actually, I've always wanted that to happen to me, but it has yet to happen because they're very well camouflaged. Um, these, the redness kind of makes them look like a, a nut or a, a group of kind of dead leaves. So they're really camouflaged and hard to see. 
but I did have a friend walking in Sandy Creek Park here in Athens um, last year, and she actually found one just about eight feet high in a little young tree, and it was just hanging out, sleeping during the day. So that's my dream. So keep your eye out someday. You might find one too. And another cool thing about the eastern red bats is that they can also hibernate under leaf piles. So you sometimes hear stories of people raking up their leaves in the fall and they find a bat and they think it's dead or sick or something, but it's not. It's actually one of these red bats that, um, oops, yay, we have unlimited minutes, sorry. Um, so yeah, these bats are hibernating under the leaves and it doesn't hurt them to be there. That's what they're supposed to do. So if you do find one under your leaf pile, just kind of put it back, don't disturb it, and it'll be just fine. And then the little brown bat is also one of, used to be one of the most common bats across most of the US, um, although it has been hit really hard by white nose syndrome, which I will talk about more in more detail in a little bit. Um, but the, the little brown bat, again, is one of those species that can live a really long time. So it's been recorded living at least 30 years in the wild, um, here, you know, here in Georgia too. So these bats, again, are living a really long time and we can, we can learn from them to figure out how can we help ourselves using this information. And like I mentioned, the two uh, bats that are endangered, the gray bat and the Indiana bat. Um, the Indiana bats are, like I said, mostly in the northern part of the state. They are really reliant on these cave systems and they're really sensitive to disturbance and changes in their cave roosting habitat, which is one of the reasons why they're endangered. Um, so we don't really see them down here in Atlanta or Athens area. So talking about some of these threats and why bats are under threat, um, loss of habitat around the world is, is pretty much the number one overall driver of bat declines. So this is loss of roosting habitat, so where they are, are um, sleeping during the day, things like you know, cutting down trees for agricultural fields or for development, um, but also it's foraging habitat. It's not just roosting habitat. So for example, the uh, bats in Australia that eat fruit, we have been clearing out a lot of fruit trees for development, like wild, wild trees that these bats feed from, which then pushes them closer to people because we have fruit orchards that the bats will then go eat at. And so this is um, kind of, pushing the bats in closer contact with people, but also limiting where they can actually go. Um, disturbance by people, like this picture here with the cave, vandalism of caves and roost habitat is a problem in some areas, especially for some of those species like the Indiana bat that are really sensitive to disturbance. Um, if you go into a cave, even, even as we as researchers go into a cave, if we're too loud, if we have too bright of lights, we can disturb the bats and they might leave that cave and never come back or they might have other um, physiological consequences. So this is why when we go into caves, we, we limit the number of people going in. We try not to talk as much as possible or if we do, we whisper and we use red light instead of bright white light um, and, and try to be as quick as possible when we're in there. Um, pesticides from eating insect is another thing that is gaining more and more attention. Um, so you know, we spray pesticides on our agricultural crops, on our gardens, and the bats can eat the insects that, or, or pick it up from the environment. Um, and it has been shown that these pesticides can kill bats outright in too high of concentration, or they can even have long-term effects, like um, it can reduce sperm count in males, which can make them uh, reproduce less. It can even pass on from the mother's milk to the baby when she's feeding it, which again can have negative consequences. So we're just kind of starting to learn all these long-term population effects of pesticides, but it's definitely a big, um, a big issue that's getting more attention. Um, also, I forgot to put the picture on here, but wind energy and other, um, other energy development is, is having an impact on bats. I'm sure we've all heard of the wind tur turbines, the big, you know, the big turbines hitting birds. Um, they also hit bats at night. Um, or the barrow trauma happens with bats. They, they get too close and the pressure change in the, the rotation of the turbines will actually make, basically make their, their lungs and their organs explode. Not, it's not that dramatic, but it basically causes internal damage, internal bleeding, which then kills them. Um, and so yeah, the, this, there's a lot of research going on into how we can mitigate these threats. Um, for example, with wind energy, can we stop the wind turbines at low wind speeds when the energy is not really 
um, being created that much. And that's when the bats are most likely to actually get hurt. So there's a lot of work going into that. And white nose syndrome. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of white nose syndrome. This is a fungal disease that we can see here. It grows on the noses, the ears, the wings, basically the skin membranes of the bats when they're hibernating in a cave. It's a cold loving fungus, so it likes cold caves. And what it does is it basically, it revs up the metabolism of the bat when it's hibernating and they get really hungry. They wake up, they get hungry, they need to eat because they're basically starving. They've, they've used up their energy reserves. So they fly outside the cave, like in this right picture here, or they die inside the cave and it's, there's no food. There's no food for the bats because it's the middle of winter um, and they either freeze to death or starve to death. And we can see here, I mean, just how many bats in a colony. This is, these are one colony that was hurt, was affected by white nose and it can kill up to 99% of a colony in a cave. Um, and it, it's, it's a devastating fungus. It's killed over 6 million bats since 2006 when we first discovered it in New York State. Um, but that's actually a really um, conservative estimate at this point. That was from like 2012. So it, it's killed a lot more bats than that. And it's, it has affected some of these bat species so hard. So this is the little brown bat again that we saw earlier that we have here in Georgia. And the little brown bat used to be one of the most common bats that you would see flying around at night, like across a lot of the country. Um, and it has been hurt so much and the populations have declined so much from white nose that states like Pennsylvania have now listed the species on their endangered species list, which is nuts. I mean, how do you go from the most common species to an endangered species in a matter of you know, 10 years or so? Um, this is how serious white nose is. So that's a very depressing picture. Um, and also with the slow reproduction of bats, this is another issue of why bats are so hard to conserve. So these pictures all show a mom bat with her pup. And I say pup because for the most part, bats, most bat species have one baby per year. That's it, they don't have litters. They're not like rodents that produce litters multiple times a year. They just have one baby a year. Um, this picture on the bottom right is the Eastern red bat that we have here in Georgia. And if we remember the Eastern red bat picture um, roosting in the tree leaves, we saw four bats in that picture. That's because red bats um, more commonly have twins or even triplets. And so that's what that picture was. And you can see here, there's, she has two pups on her. But for the most part, bats around the world have one baby a year. So you can imagine if something happens to a colony of bats, it's not gonna rebound quickly. It's gonna take years for that population to recover and gain the numbers back. So that is a lot of doom and gloom, and um, I always like to end on a positive note about what we can do to help bats, because all these threats around the world, how can we actually help here in our own backyards or where, wherever we are? So there are some amazing bat organizations around the world doing great research and conservation and education work. So these are just some of them. Um, I do have some the links here, and I can share a PDF of this PowerPoint. I think, Liam, we can post this on the website afterwards. So we can actually, so you can click on these links. Um, but Bat Conservation International is a great organization that does a lot of research and conservation work. The Luby Bat Conservancy is cool. It's actually, it's in Florida and they actually have live bats that have been rescued from like roadside zoos, for example. So you can actually go on a, a bat tour there and see the bats um, and, and take pictures of the bats. So I highly recommend going there. Bat World Sanctuary is a similar thing. It's a rehabilitation center. Um, so they actually have these bats that they're rehabilitating and caring for because they can't be released into the wild. And the Save Lucy campaign is, is, does a really great job with a lot of education work. Um, so again, joining or donating to these groups is a great way to help. Also, if you have kids or if there are any kids listening, um, some of these organizations have an Adopt a Bat program. Um, of course, you don't actually get a bat. You know, it's illegal to have a bat unless you have a license. Um, but these programs you donate and you get information about the species or the individual bat that you're helping. And your money goes towards research or for actually caring for that individual bat. 
Um, I know I did this in third grade with my third grade class and we adopted a puffin, I think, from one of the zoos. Um, and it's, it's a fun class project or scout group or even for a birthday if you, if you want to donate to bats. This is a fun way to, to help. If you are a gardener, um, you can do bat friendly gardening. So we might wonder, well, we don't have any nectar feeding bats here in Georgia. They all eat insects. So how can we help bats with a garden? Well, what you can do is you can plant some night blooming flowers that open at night and then the nocturnal insects will come, you know, drink from the nectar and our insect eating bats can then come and eat those insects. So you'll have your own little ecosystem in your garden and helping the bats at the same time. Um, if you plant herbs and aromatic flowers, that's also good to attract those insects the bats can eat. Having a water body, if you have a pond or if you're near a river or a lake is great because the bats do need to drink water and also that can attract some insects for them to eat. And like we mentioned before, if you can, don't use pesticides or um, you know, use less if you, if you can. Um, we've actually, some of the work we've been doing here in Athens, we've been putting together a list of build your own bat garden plants. Um, and again, I can share this information, you'll see it and you can see it here. Um, we are, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Athens Bat Connection in a minute, um, but we have a website and we're going to be putting this information on our website soon. Um, so check this out. Also, here are some other links that you'll be able to click on in the presentation of, again, the list of native Georgia plants that we put on our brochure from the Georgia DNR. Um, and then there's two other websites that have great gardening for bats tips. Putting up a bat house. So I know I get a lot of questions about attracting bats to your area. You can put up a bat house and while they're not always successful and sometimes you have to play around with where you put it and move it around a little, um, a bat house can provide a roosting habitat for bats. So you can put them on a pole, like on pole mounted bat houses do really well for the most part. Same thing with building mounted bat houses. They tend to do really well because they're really thermally stable on the side of a house. Um, the higher up, the better you would want to install a bat house at least 12 feet from the bottom of the house to the ground. But the higher, the better. I say if you can get at least 15 feet or higher is, is better. Um, again, some resources that you can, you can look at. Bat Conservation International has the Bat House Builders Handbook, which is a little book, a little booklet that has a ton of great tips on where to put up bat houses and how to do it. And also, step-by-step uh, -step plans for building your own from scratch. If you're more into the um, kind of assembly versus building from scratch, these two organizations have bat house kits that I've even helped five-year-olds build. Um, you do need a power tool and, it, and caulk and stuff, but they're really easy to assemble. Um, and Habitat for Bats is a Georgia company. So if you buy from there, you're, you're supporting a local Georgia company. Um, so now a little bit about some of the work we've been doing here in Athens. Um, we, over the past couple years, have been doing a lot more bat conservation work. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources also has a really great uh, group of bat biologists here in Athens and across the state. So there's a lot of great work going on. And we have, um, like I said, created a new website, the Athens Bat Connection, .wordpress.com, that you can check out. And the Bulldogs for, for Bats program is through the University of Georgia where we hosted a fundraiser to raise money to build bat houses and put them up across town. So if you're in town, you can check out our local bat houses. Um, we have them up at different locations around town. We have some at Dudley Park, uh, which is where we were supposed to be today, unfortunately, for our bat walk, um, but unfortunately can't be there. But um, there are bats roosting in these bat houses. There's a little colony of evening bats roosting there right now. Um, so you can go check them out and you don't want to disturb them, but you can, you know, see the bat houses. And if you're there in the evening, if you stay, you know, on the path, you can actually see them come out in the evening. Um, Easley's Mill, so at the end of the trail across from Mama's Boy, there's bat houses. Across the UGA campus, we have different locations on campus. And then the Botanical Garden are some bat houses that we put up. Um, some of the, the ones at Dudley Park have a really cool, two really cool signs that explain about bats here in Athens and some of the species that you might see in the bat houses. Um, so these, uh, these drawings are amazing. These drawings are from a local artist, Will Eskridge. He's a local wildlife artist here in Athens. Um, so if you're interested in 
wildlife art, definitely check him out. He, he did the artwork for these signs and he's a pretty cool artist. Um, but you can check out these signs and you can see them up at the bat houses. Now, when we go to the bat houses, we can actually use little infrared cameras to look up inside the bat house. So I don't know if you can see my screen here, but this is a tiny little infrared camera, <laughs> really tiny, um, that we can put on this really tall pole and put up into the bottom of the bat house to see if there's bats in there. And what do we find? Well, this is a picture um, of some evening bats in the bat house and we can see them up in there and they're pretty cute. Um, they're just hanging out. And then the video, we can record video with the infrared camera. And this is what we see. Oh, there they are. We can see them peeking out in there. They like to be together. So you'll see them huddled together. This is two of, the, two of them. Um, a lot of the bats we have here in Athens and in Georgia are colonial roosting. So they're in groups. Um, the, the females tend to form larger groups of, of individuals because they like to be with others when they give birth to their pup. Um, and that, that helps them stay warm and stay safe. Whereas the male bats tend to roost more either alone or in small bachelor colonies, is what they're called, um, with other males. So we can see them up in there and they're still there. I checked a couple weeks ago in the Dudley Park bat houses and they are still there. They were there last year. Um, I can't say for sure, but I, I think it's the same group that was there last summer, um, which is pretty cool. Oops, and then we have this video. Oops, sorry, I'll go back. So this video here, is it gonna play? There we go. This is an infrared video of bats coming out at night. The, these are um, different bats. These are different bat houses in Texas that I built. These are the Mexican free-tailed bats that we learned about. But you can see them. Here they come. They kind of throw themselves out and they like, leap off and then they kind of swoop down and fly away. Um, and it's, it's pretty fun to watch. Like I said, if you ever get a chance to go to the Dudley Park bat houses, it's pretty fun to watch. And there they go. Wee. And then this is a thermal imaging. Um, so this is um, the thermal camera that picks up the body heat of the bat. And this is the ones in Texas that I built as an undergrad, but you can see this is in the morning. So this is when they're going back into the bat house. So you can see they land on the landing pad and then they crawl up into it. There you go. And then they crawl up in there and then they sleep during the day inside. Um, so these are, this is what we're hoping to see a big colony of bats in the Dudley Park. Uh, because they can eat lots of, like I said, lots of mosquitoes and other insects. Also, if you're in the Athens area, we periodically do bat walks like we are going to do today um, through the, the program. Uh, we do what well, we can see the bat houses. Um, we have uh, acoustic detectors that plug into your smartphone. So like I can show around, at, we can actually listen for bats as they're flying around and identify what species they are from the echolocation call that we can see on the screen. Um, so yeah, come to these events. We're gonna be posting more information about these events on our website. So again, find us online. Um, we have this new website. Um, it's still under development, so it not, it's not done by any means, but check it out. And before we do some more show and tell, I want to take you on a virtual tour. So um, I mentioned that we have these bat houses all around town. So where are they and what do they look like? So if you go to the Athens Bat Connection website, which it should pull up. So we go to the website here. And if you scroll down, you'll see this uh, screenshot of our story map. So if you've ever heard of the online story maps, we've created one for the bat houses in Athens. So you'll click on this full interactive map button. And then we see, we'll actually be able to take a virtual tour. So these are, you can see the map of Athens and we can see pictures of each of the sites where we can find bat houses. So you can, let me pull this up here. Um, you can start your tour, start exploring and it'll take you to the top one. And look, there are those Dudley, Dudley Park bat houses. And you can read more about the bats in the bat house and there's also a pollinator garden there around those bat houses. So you can check that out. And again, we're gonna be adding more information to these story maps, but um, I just wanted to show you, give you an idea. So now if we click on the air, the now is um, Easley's Mill, again, right next to Mama's Boy. And again, we can see what that looks like and learn about some of the bats that have been there. 
You can go to the next one, Lumpkin Woods. So this is on campus. Um, these are two bat houses. Unfortunately, have not been occupied yet, but fingers crossed someday. Um, Driftmeyer Engineering Building on South Campus. Um, again, I mentioned the males and females. So these are more likely to be the, um, the males because it's a shadier spot. It's a cooler bat house. So they're probably more likely to be males roosting here. So yeah, we can take a, a tour of all these different ones um, and then see all around town where the bat houses are. So that is my official presentation, but I do wanna do a quick show and tell real quick before we have Q&A and I wanna save time for Q&A. So um, let me pull out some cool show and tell. Um, so this is one of the infrared cameras that I mentioned that we use to watch the bats, the bat house. Um, so it's a Sony camcorder, um, and basically you just need a camcorder with night shot capability um, that can see at night. And then we use these little infrared lamps that are, that provide supplemental infrared light. And you can actually light up like a whole pitch black room with these lights. And we can't see the lights obviously because it's infrared, but the camera can pick it up. Um, and then we also have some cool night vision binoculars that are um, that we use to monitor. Like these are ones that I use um, for my research in Mexico. They look like regular binoculars, but they're digital and they have infrared, basically like you're in the, the army or something out at night spying. Um, and then when we go out and catch bats, people always ask me like, how do you catch bats? You know, what do you, and what do you do with them when you catch them? So what we do is we, mostly use a mist net. Um, if you've ever, has anyone banded birds or caught birds? Um, it's the same net that you would use to catch birds. Um, unfortunately, bats have teeth and so they like to chew on the net. So yeah, birders hate bat people using their nets because um, they chew giant holes if you don't get to them in time. But if you've never seen a mist net, this is what it looks like. It's basically a giant hair net. You know, it looks like one of those, those hair nets. Um, and it's really fine filament. And what we do, they're, they're like 30 feet long and they can be like 30 feet tall. Um, and what happens is the bats, when they're flying along, I have my little demo bat we'll use. So we have a little demo bat and it flies along and it, it can see, but again, it's flying really fast and they can't really pick it up with their echolocation. So they fly into it and get stuck. And then they, uh, they're stuck in there. And then we come along, we check the nets like every, 10 minutes is the recommendation so that they don't get stressed out. We put our gloves on. We always wear gloves when we handle bats or wildlife because um, we don't want to spread any of the white nose fungus or any other diseases to other bats that we handle. And of course, we also don't want to get bitten. You know, we don't, bats will defend themselves just like any animal, so we wear gloves. So we have our gloves on and we carefully take it out of the net. Depending on the species, big brown bats are really, really loud. They like to scream a lot. Other bats just sit there and don't do anything. So this depends on the species. Um, so we have our bat and then what do we do? Well, we take morphometric measurements. So we're taking measurements of their body. So we have fancy calipers, which um, if you don't know what they are, they're basically like a fancy ruler. Um, and we measure their forearm. So we have right here, measure their forearm. And then we have about six centimeters. It's a nice big bat. And then we weigh them um, and we have bags. We don't, this is a, like a makeup bag, but we have special bags that we actually actually use um, that we've weighed the bags. We know how much it is. We kind of take the little bat and put them in there gently, of course. And then we use a little hanging scale to clip on to the, to the bag and then weigh it. This bat's a, like a honker. It maxed out my, uh, my weight. So we can't really weigh it. We would have a bigger weight for this bat. Um, but it's at least 50 grams, which is a nice healthy bat. And then we would look at the bat. Um, we would look at if it's a male or female, look at the, if it's reproductive or not. Um, you can tell if it's an adult or a juvenile based on the wing bone, based on the joint bone or the joints of the bone. If it's a juvenile, that means that the elbow joint is see-through basically it hasn't fused together yet if it's an adult it's solid it's fused um, we can't tell the number of years past adult we can just say juvenile or adult um, and then yeah with all that information we can tell what species it is um, and then yeah let it go so then the best part you know you have it on your hand and then off they they fly 
and that's it. Um, we process fats very quickly. We usually don't keep them unless you're doing a different type of study, but um, about 10 minutes and then you let them go. Um, so that's how we handle bats. Um, I do want to show real quick a bat house demo so you can see what a bat house looks like up close. So we saw the bat house in the pictures, but this is what one actually looks like in, um, up close. So it's not painted. You would, of course, want to paint or stain your bat house um, so that it weathers the weather better. Um, and this is cut out here as a demo. So normally it would be, you know, it would go down all the way, but it's cut out so you can see the inside. And we can see this one is a two chamber bat house. So it has the two separate rooms that the bats can actually crawl between. Um, so we have that. Um, more chambers is better. Um, I usually recommend three chamber bat houses or higher if you can, um, because the bats again can move around. If one chamber gets too hot or too cold, they can move to another one. Um, and now, before we do q and I have some bat specimens. So this is um, some bats from the local Georgia Museum here in Athens. Um, and these are just to show differences in some of our local bats. Of course, these specimens are dead. They're museum specimens. Some of these are actually from like the 1920s. So they're like really old bats. Um, but you can see here, this is a big brown bat. So again, remember when I say big brown, people are like, oh, it must be giant. It's not, it's, it's smaller than my hand. And we can see here, we have the, see how thin the tail membrane and the wing membrane is? You can actually see through it. Um, it's very thin. Um, we can see the tail here coming through and then the membrane around the tail. They have their little feet. So they have the same five toes that we do. Really cute and they use those to grab on and hold on when they're sleeping. Um, and it has its ears that it uses to, here, it's echolocation. And I can't pull the wing out because it's, you know, it's stiff, but it would have the, the wings and the five fingers. Now we have another one, the eastern red bat. Remember the one that roosts in the, in the tree leaves? And we can see it's a little bit smaller and it's really red. Can you see how red and orange the fur is compared to the big brown bat? Again, that's why it's called the red bat. And remember, these ones are the ones that are roosting in the tree leaves. And so if we look at the tail membrane, can you see all the fur? Can you see how fuzzy that tail membrane is? Whereas if we look at the big brown tail membrane, there's no fur on that one. And that's because these ones are safely roosting inside you know, cavities, inside trees or buildings, whereas this one's outside in the elements and has to be more protected. So that's why these ones are really furry. They have a lot of fur to help them keep warm and stay protected. Now, this is, again, one of my favorites, the Mexican free-tailed bat. This is the one that flies 100 miles an hour, the one that is in the 20 million cave. Little guy, again, not, not very big, but it's called a free-tail because we can see the tail sticks out from the membrane, so it's free of the membrane. That's why it's called a free-tail. And there are, there are other free-tailed bat species around the world. Um, and again, you know, has its little ears. They kind of have a dopey look. I always think they look kind of dopey. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they, they are flying really fast, eating lots of agricultural pests. So these are really beneficial to have around. Um, so those are my, my show and tell. So I think we can open it up for questions now. I'm sure there, I see some in the chats already. Awesome. Thank you so much for the presentation, Kristen. It was really interesting. Yeah, yeah it looks like we have uh, some questions in the chat. I have some of my own that I've got um, to, to add on to at the end. Awesome. Uh, but so first up, it looks like from Jacqueline Miller, we have, uh, do bats ever drink from bird baths? Ooh, um, that's a good question. I, so bats, when they drink, usually swoop over the water. So they're, they don't they don't usually stop to drink. Um, and because, that's, because a lot of bat species can't actually take off from the ground and fly. Some can, but a lot can't. So usually they're, they're drinking from larger bodies, so like a larger pond or a lake. So bird bats are probably too small for a bat to actually drink from. But again, if it might attract insects that the bats can eat around the area. So good question. True. I was wondering about that too, um, yeah. uh, having a fountain in the garden, if that would have helped, but okay. Yeah. Um, and let's see. 
Awesome. Well, next up is how do you tell whether it's male or female? Can you identify it just by like looking at different features? And yes, you can. Or? Just like we do, right? You look for the, the penis in the male. Um, and if it doesn't, then it's a female. Um, the, the reproductive status is a little harder sometimes to tell, but um, I wish I had pictures. You actually, so just like with birds, you'll like kind of blow up the, the fur in this case to see what's there. Um, if it's a female also, it, and if it's lactating and has a pup, then it'll have nipples that you can visibly see. Um, so there's different reproductive stages that we look for also, in addition to just male or female. Yeah, good question. And actually, this may be TMI, but I think it's really cool. So there's actually some bat species around the world can only be told from apart from another species based on the penis morphology. So based on the penis shape. Um, and so one of my colleagues in Australia actually did a study where he had to look at a bunch of bat penises and measure them and look at their characteristics and their shape to identify the species. And so yeah, that's way too much more that, than we normally do. But, um, but yeah, it's one of the ways you can tell different species apart. Be cool. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then let's see, from Jacqueline Miller. So how prevalent is rabies in bats here in Georgia? Good question. So rabies is actually, in bats, is really low. Um, so it's actually more common in animals like skunks and foxes. Um, the estimate around the country is about less than one half of 1% of wild bats have rabies. So it's less, I mean, less than 1%. Um, about, so of the bats that are submitted for testing to the CDC, for example, about 6% of those test positive for rabies. But that makes sense because if you find a bat and a bat that is submitted for testing is more likely to be sick. Um, if you find a bat or any animal that's on the ground in a place where it's not supposed to be or acting weirdly, it, it could be sick with rabies or any other you know, disease, just like when we get sick. Um, so that's why if you do find a bat on the ground, um, don't, don't handle it. Um, you can, what you can do is get like a shoe box or a box and put it on top of it and kind of get it with a card, piece of cardboard or something so you don't hurt it. Um, and then keep it in the box and call the local um, animal control or not animal control, but the, um, the DNR has a list of groups that you can call to here in Georgia. So check that out. But in general, rabies is, it's more, more prevalent in other animals. Spots. Okay. Um, and the next one is from me actually. Uh, so it's where is the largest concentration of species of bat? Um, I noticed mm -hmm. that you said there were approximately 1400 that we know of in the world. Yes and there's 47 in the US. So is there like a part of the world where there's just a really high concentration of species of bats? Yes, or? that's a great question. So yeah, so places like the tropics tend to have more species of, of any animal in general. Um, so I think Indonesia has the, the, is the country with the most bat species. And I think they have about 215 or so species in just in that area. Um, so yeah, those tropical areas, Mexico, where I work across Mexico has about 150, I think. Um, so yeah, there's definitely kind of hot spots and that's what we call them hot spots where there's high diversity, um, of species. Yeah. And I think in the U S Texas is, has the most, um, and Arizona has a lot too, but I think Texas has the most, of course. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Hot spots, both temperature and for <laughs> Arizona. Yeah, if you have one of those, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. Nice. Okay. And then from Jenna Dotson. So why is having a free tail advantageous? Does it help with speedy flight? Oh, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I, they do use the, the tail membrane to, to fly and to navigate. Um, you can see videos on the internet of bats, like really are very maneuverable with their wing membrane. And so, yeah, I would imagine that can function in some way, but I'm actually not sure. I need to look that up. I love doing these talks because I always learn something new too. Yeah. Um, questions are always good, you know, gets you yeah. thinking about things. And then from Mark Merlin, um, bats have become a topic of discussion relating to COVID-19. Um, because they're very good at mounting immune response to outwit evolving viruses. Are you familiar with this phenomenon and can you comment on it? Yeah, a great, great question. So, um, so with COVID, um, I will comment, we still are learning so much about where, where it came from and it probably will be 
several years before we actually know where it came from. Um, right now, the closest known DNA or RNA match uh, to the COVID-19 virus is in a horseshoe bat in China. It's one of, one of the horseshoe bat species, um, but it's not the same virus. So with the evolutionary, they did some studies and the, those two viruses, the COVID-19 virus and the one that we've currently found in the horseshoe bat diverged about 40 to 50 years ago into separate viruses. So they had a common ancestor, but they're, they're no longer the same virus. Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't actually know where that, the COVID-19 virus came from. Um, but with, like I said, with the bats, you know, they do have really great immune responses to viruses and other, other diseases. Um, and there are several kind of hypotheses about why that e evolved. Um, one is the flight as fever hypothesis, um, which basically says that because bats are flying and that really ramps up their metabolism, bats' body temperatures are really high. So when they're flying, I forget what, it's like 104 or 108 degrees Fahrenheit when they're flying. So they're really, they have a high body temperature. And because of that, they can kind of kill off a lot of viruses that would otherwise be killed, you know, with a, a fever. Um, and so some of those viruses can withstand that, which is why, for example, if, um, if we would get something that was adapted to that fever, uh, then we wouldn't be able to fight it off. Because if we get 108 fever, you know, it's kind of bad for us. Um, so, so that's why, yeah, they, they evolved. It's, it has to do with their flight probably, with their um, metabolism um, and, and those evolutionary processes. But we're still learning a lot um, about that and why they can do that which is, I think, super cool. That's a great question. Oh, I think you're muted, Liam. <laughs> um, there we go, okay. Sometimes the click pad on my laptop um, oh. is fidgety, but uh, yeah, okay, well, thank you for that like, yeah. explanation good on that question. topic. Um, and the next one I was wondering was, mm -hmm. are there hierarchical structures in bat colonies? Because I'm thinking, sort of analogous to like one of the more common colonies we think of as like a bee, um, if there's any yeah. sort of hierarchy to that. Yeah, so yes and no, it depends on the species. Uh -huh. um, so like I said, there's 1400 over 14 around the world. Um, and so you can imagine they're all very different. Um, so some bats like the red bats that we saw are solitary roosters for the most part. They, they, the mom with her pups would roost together, but they don't roost in colonies. So those are individual. Uh, bats. But the ones that do roost in colonies tend to have some sort of structure, not nearly as sophisticated and as tight as a bee colony. Um, but for example, the flying foxes, um, the one, you know, the ones you see in Australia hanging in the, in the trees, they, they do have a social structure. And um, it, it appears that the, the higher ranked individuals roost higher in the tree, and the lower ranked individuals roost lower. <laughs> And you can imagine what happens to those lower, the ones lower in the tree when the top ones pee and poop, they get covered, right? And so it makes sense that the higher ranked ones would be higher up. Um, so there's some of that happening. Um, vampire bat colonies actually have really sophisticated social structures too. Um, vampire bats live in, in colonies and they have to eat basically every night, every night or two in order to survive. They don't store fat like other animals do. Um, and so if they go out and one of the bats happens to not find a, you know, a cat or a cattle or something to feed on, and it comes back to the cave and it's hungry, other bats in the colony will actually feed it. They'll regurgitate some of the blood that they ate and feed it to that individual. And that individual that's being fed will remember who fed, who fed him. And then when that other one gets hungry sometime in the future, he'll feed it. So it's a very, it's a reciprocal social relationship, um, food sharing, and there's a lot of research going into uh, the social structure of vampire bats. So, um, and there's, there's lots of other social structures in bats too. Um, so yeah, they're, they're pretty fascinating. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's really cool. No, yeah. nice. Okay, and then, oh, we have some new ones now. Okay, um, so from Mark Merlin, Again, uh, bats are sometimes used as examples of altruistic behavior because they can care for other colony members by feeding yep. um, if they are incapacitated or so I've heard. Okay, yeah, so is this the case? Yeah, yes, so that is, yeah, vampire bats are a great example of that. Um, 
other bats that like insect eating bats, the ones we have around here might not necessarily like feed something to the other one, but a lot of times they will um, be in groups like family groups. So like a, a mom with her, her young um, and then maybe her sister or her aunt um, or her mother. So they'll be in these little family groups that can then travel together um, to forage. So um, it, not necessarily like help altruistically helping the other, but they do have these social ties. Again, not all species, but some. And then uh, from Brandy, um, is there any truth to the stories about bat poo causing hysteria? I've never heard that one. I'm curious to hear, like, what, what is that? I, I have heard of, uh, obviously, bat poop being uh, fertilizer, mm -hmm. which is definitely true. Bat guano is super high in nitrogen. Um, and so people sometimes collect it from underneath a roost, and you can put it on your garden. Um, mm -hmm. If you do do that, don't put too much on because it's very strong fertilizer. Um, but I have not heard the bat poo causing hysteria. Um, there, I'm, there's no, I'm sure there's no. Um, no truth to that. The one thing with bat guano in high concentrations that can happen is that if you go into a, for example, Bracken Cave with the 20 million bats, if you go in there without a, a respirator on, mm -hmm. first of all, there's a huge high concentration of ammonia and other gases that is really bad for you. Um, but also um, some of the fungus like histoplasmosis, the fungus that causes histoplasmosis, you know, you can breathe that in. And um, again, that's usually only a problem in those like whether well, there's thousands of bats, you know, in one small spot. Um, so not usually an issue. Mm, I'm imagining, it kind of rings a bell. I'm imagining it's sort of in the context of perhaps like, uh, like something ingested in a sense, like the mm -hmm. bat poo or whatnot. Um, but I don't know if Brandy, if you could elaborate, if you would like uh, to sort of explain what you were asking about. But, um, if not, uh, the other, one other question I had was sort of about the bat houses that we can build. Yeah. Um, and so does the shape of a bat house have any significance? Because I saw different ones that you had shown in the pictures. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so yeah, what, there's lots of different types of bat houses that are kind of being developed now, but the standard one that you're gonna find on online or you know in those kits is this the one that I showed, the, the flat one. And that's called a standard, you know, standard house. Um, it can have multiple chambers, but it's that flat kind of structure. Um, and those are those tend to be really good. Um, however, the other ones that we saw in the video that are called rocket boxes. And those are um, some of the ones in Dudley Park and around campus. And we built those two different types of houses because different species might prefer different structures. Um, so when I did un some undergrad research in Texas, I built the two different kinds and put them side by side. And it appeared that, in, at least there, the evening bats were preferring the rocket box versus the standard house. And the Mexican freetail bat was preferring the standard house um, when they had the option. Um, so yeah, if you can put multiple types up, you can provide kind of different microclimates, different habitat for different species. Um, but the, the ones that, the evening bats that are there now in Dudley Park are roosting in the standard house. So, you know, it's not like a hard and fast rule by any means. Good question. Interesting. Okay, yeah. I guess it might be, in a sense, also sort of like how we like different styles of houses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably a good idea. I know this one looks better. <laughs> Not Actually, thinking about, um, I'll say for the looks and the aesthetics of a bat house, um, I get the question a lot of like, what color should I paint a bat house? Um, and the color itself doesn't matter. What matters is the shade of the color. Um, and so here in Georgia, because it gets pretty hot in the summer, we would want to paint a bat house a medium shade of any color. So like a medium brown or medium green. It can be me medium pink. You know, it can, you can paint a design on it. The bats don't really, you know, care what it looks like. The, the reason for the shade option or this shade choice is because that helps it heat up or stay cool inside the bat house. So if we put up a, a black bat house here in Georgia, it would get really hot inside there. Um, and the females do like it pretty hot over like 100 degrees in the bat house, but it can get too hot. Um, if we put up a white bat house, that might not get quite warm enough inside. Um, if you live in Alaska, you would want to put up a black bat house. So, you know, it, it depends on where you live, but um, it basically has to do with temperature. Nice. 
movies. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah, there's lots of lots of cool nuances to bat houses. It's fun. And then uh, a couple notes from Brandy. Um, going back to the like hysteria with like bat poo, like in terms of common expressions of like bat crazy. Um, yes. And, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Um, being based on, like, hearing about those being based on actual um, experiences, especially in large colonies and caves in Texas. Um, huh. So. I'm going to have to look that up because, um, I obviously, the bad crazy um, yeah. is a, an expression. Um, and, yeah, I'm going to have to look that up because I'm really interested in that. But, mm -hmm. no, I mean, there's really, there's nothing that's going to affect your brain. <laughs> it's just, again, the negative associations with bats and people think bats are scary or crazy, you know, so. Yeah, it has more to do with that. It's a great okay. question. And then uh, from Jenna about sharing the links in the presentation, um, we will be getting those out to the people here in some way, shape, or form, probably multiple. Um, I know I'll be sharing our Facebook link event because um, mm -hmm. we'll be posting some stuff after the event there um, for people to access again. And then also on our website and other ways as well. You can always also, um, my email, I'll share it at the end. And so if you don't have other ways to access it, you can always just email me and I can probably get it to you that way. Um, and then from Brandy, other than having food and water resources, how can you draw bats to a newly installed bat house? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, there's no like tried and true way to get like to actually get bats to come. Um, I know some people um, have tried like putting guano, like older guano on the, the bat house to make it smell more like a bat roost. Um, there's no conclusive evidence to show that, that works. Um, and there could be some issues with like disease spread. If you're, if there's the fungus in there, maybe you're spreading it to your bat house. Um, some people have said using um, older wood that has been kind of out already because you know, new wood tends to have that chemically smell, you know, and that might deter bats for a little while. So maybe using older wood um, instead of new wood. Um, but also in terms of having a bat house, the location where you put it is really important um, to attracting bats. So you, you're not gonna wanna put it in like in the woods or in among trees because the bats need room to fly around. Like we saw in those, those videos, they need to be able to swoop in and swoop out. Um, so they need open space. Um, and so putting it kind of like along a tree line that we saw in some of those pictures of our local bat houses um, or out in the middle of a little field is good. Um, they recommend at least six hours of direct sunlight a day, if, if possible. Um, so morning sun is great um, if you can get morning sun in, on the house. Um, facing the house like south, southeast is good here. Um, again, if, if you have a really shady area and like it's not going to get much sun at all, you could then maybe paint it a darker color, like a black, because you wouldn't normally do that here in Georgia. But if, if it's literally not getting any direct sun, then it might need that darker paint to get absorb what sun it does get. Um, so yeah, things like that. And if you have a water body nearby, that's great. Um, if, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to like make the bats come. But if you do see bats flying around like your yard, um, if you put up the bat house kind of where they're flying, they're, they're likely to at least investigate it. Um, they're very curious animals. You know, if something giant and new goes up where they've normally been flying, they're probably going to check it out. Um, and also with bats, I will say with bat houses, because we have the females, but we also have the males that tend to roost by themselves or in very small groups. And they do move around, they can move around quite a bit to different roosts. So you might have a bat in your bat house for a few days and then it goes away. And then a few weeks later, it might come back. And you might not see it. Like when you're checking inside the bat house, you might not be there on that day. But that doesn't necessarily mean there hasn't ever been a bat there. Um, and so that is, you know, something to keep in mind, too. It's you're probably not going to get the huge colonies, but you might it might be a, a transient roost that is used. Um, so just you know, checking for guano under the, the roost um, is, is a good way to try to see if there has been a bat there. Good question. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation again and for answering the questions. Okay. Um, I don't think anyone have any other questions. Uh, now is your chance. <laughs> Speak now or forever hold your peace. But okay. Um, well, I will go ahead. I'm going to drop um, a series of different links in to the group chat.
um, for everyone to have access to. Uh, so first, well, let's see how it formats, just to make sure, okay. So first is um, our survey for the post, like just about this talk and whatnot. Um, it's really quick, it should only take a couple minutes to fill out. Um, from what I understand, the link isn't active in the chat, um, or it may be like for some people or not. Um, so just go ahead and either copy and paste, or if you're able to, you can click and it should take you directly to the Google form. And then uh, next that I'm dropping is just our website for Science for Georgia. Um, so there you'll be able to see all about us, um, see all the different programming and events we do. We do different blog posts regularly, ask a scientist where you can submit a question to be answered on our social media, um, science communications training. We also have like different t-shirts. I've got like my like science tales and trails one on now. Uh, and I also want to highlight recently um, Science Atlanta has started a, it's a, another organization, um, has started their new programming Wondercast. So if you haven't seen that, you should go ahead and check that out online. Um, and then, of course, we also do our science tales and trails, um, both in Atlanta and here in Athens. So that's that link. Um, and then also uh, coming in is the Facebook event page for today's event, um, where we should be able to post uh, like the event survey again afterwards in case you aren't able to access it here. Um, and then also be able to share uh, the different links and information that was posted uh, in today's presentation because um, I think some people Jenna was asking about that so that's the event and then the last one I want to share is just my email um, so if you have questions that maybe you think of something after the fact that you want to ask Kristen I can put you in contact or um, if you want any of the links that were shared and information that was shared today so yeah, that's that's great great job and so uh, that was all I had um, for today. So I will hang out in the chat um, for anyone who's still like copying down the links or getting that information um, for another couple minutes and then I will. Stop. So thank you again so much today for coming, Kristen. Yeah, thank yeah, you for having me. Great, great. <laughs> but, all right. Well, have a good day, everyone. Have a good Saturday. Bye, everyone. <laughs>